Regina was having a nightmare. It felt endless, dragging on for far too long. It's time to wake up, the thought echoed in her head, time to wake up, now. But she couldn't wake up. Faces flashed before her, people dressed in white. Sometimes she felt a slight pain, other times she would drift away, sinking into dark, comforting oblivion. Familiar faces would appear occasionally, but Regina couldn't recall their names. She only remembered that she had once known these people, maybe even loved them. People in white. Regina tried to ask for help, but she couldn't. They didn't hear her, didn't understand, or simply didn't want to listen. The most terrifying part was the face of the woman who had caused this nightmare. She came almost every day or maybe every hour, Regina had long lost track of time. That woman was always there, as if waiting for something. Regina didn't know how to escape this torment, and she couldn't think clearly. Her thoughts were sluggish, like thick syrup. It took immense effort to control them, and she was out of strength. That woman was always nearby. The woman who had tried to do something terrible to her. And that meant she could try again at any moment. This time, she would succeed. A year and a half earlier. What did I do wrong? Regina exclaimed. She felt terribly sorry for herself. Why did this misfortune befall her? Nicole, meanwhile, acted as if she didn't understand, looking at her and smiling. You're wrong about everything, Nicole calmly replied, drink your coffee before it gets cold. What coffee? Regina waved her hand dismissively, you really don't get it, do you? He's still my son, he's only twenty-two, just twenty-two. He's a child. He's not much of a child. If you recall, he was already chasing girls at five. I still can't forget that story with Mina. Regina chuckled. Oh yes, her only son had realized early on that girls liked him, and he had tried to bring his first bride home when he was still in kindergarten. Her name was Mina. Leo had chosen her simply because she had the prettiest braids in the class. But the wedding didn't happen. Regina and Mina's parents agreed that five was a bit young to move in together. They suggested the children wait a bit and see how their feelings developed. So Leo shifted his attention to Annabelle. He was drawn to Annabelle's red hair. He even gave her gifts, shared his candy with her. But it didn't work out. Annabelle hit Leo with a bucket in the sandbox. After Annabelle came Meg, but their relationship was more about convenience. Meg had a very cool remote-controlled toy dump truck. Regina was convinced that Leo was more interested in the dowry than the bride herself. He was just a little boy. Regina sighed, Nicole, by the way, I called you here for moral support, not to watch you laugh at my misery. What misery, Regina? Don't be dramatic. It's a good day, we're in a cafe, the coffee's good. Nobody died. Your Leo just decided to get married. Regina shook her head in despair. Just decided to get married. Do you even know who to, Nicole? She's nobody. He brought her over yesterday. She didn't say much, just looked around. Probably scouting the place. She's a country bumpkin. Regina, Nicole leaned across the table and placed her hand on Regina's forehead, are you delirious? No fever, huh? What's there to scout, anyway? And what does it matter where she's from? It matters, Regina insisted, and don't forget, we're a respectable family. She's from who knows where, Nicole. And do you know what I have to do this Saturday? What do you have to do? Nicole sighed. Meet her parents. They live in Frosttown. So what? Nicole shrugged, taking a small sip of her coffee, you talk as if you're visiting them in prison. Oh, stop it. Regina stared thoughtfully out the cafe window, maybe I can still call off the wedding. What do you think? You're crazy. Give Leo some freedom. Divorce isn't banned in this country. They'll live together, and if they don't like it, they'll split up. 70% of marriages end in divorce, according to statistics, Regina. 
so there's a good chance they'll break up eventually anyway. She walked home in the worst mood. Nicole just didn't get it. Her own daughter was only 10, and it would be a long time before she'd bring some questionable person home and announce, this is my fiancé. Now it seemed Leo had finally grown up. And he brought home a big problem named Gabby. Although the thought that 70% of marriages end in divorce did comfort Regina a little. Regina didn't like Gabby from the start. Skinny, with arms like twigs, and her facial features were too small. Her eyes were tiny. What could Leo possibly see in her? And worst of all, he didn't bring her over to ask for his parents' opinion. He just presented it as a fact, this is my fiancé. Get ready, mom and dad. We're meeting her parents in Frosttown this Saturday. At home, Regina was greeted by dinner, prepared by Porter and her husband. Porter loved cooking, and he was good at it, never letting his wife near the stove. Which suited Regina just fine. She wondered if Gabby even knew how to cook. Porter met her in the hallway. How was the coffee? Terrible. She took off her beige, elegant coat and carefully hung it up. Nicole doesn't understand me at all. She just sat there smiling, saying nothing bad had happened. What exactly happened? Porter asked with irony, immediately receiving an angry glare from his wife. Seriously? Regina threw up her hands, Leo just brought this girl home yesterday and intends to marry her, by the way. Oh, Regina. Porter smiled, we got married young too, and look, everything's fine. I was only a year older than Leo is now, if you remember. That was different, she replied, we were more responsible. I knew how to take care of the house. You'd already defended your dissertation. And we had good reasons to hurry. Do you think Gabby can even make tea, Porter? Oh, of course, it's different. Ha. Huh. Well, I'm sure she can manage to make tea. And if not, you can help her out. Porter raised his hands in mock surrender, not wanting to argue with his wife. But he was still smiling, and that irritated Regina, as if no one understood how serious this was, that her only son was making a terrible mistake. Regina believed a mother's heart couldn't be wrong, and hers was practically screaming. Gabby was a terrible choice, and Leo was still just a child. Maybe she bewitched him. Maybe there's a powerful witch in Frosttown. Let's go eat, okay? Porter sighed, I roasted chicken, just the way you like it. When's Leo coming home? He said tonight. He went for another interview and then has a date. See? Regina waved her finger in front of her husband's face, he doesn't even have a job yet, and he wants to get married. She's got him under a spell. Her husband hugged and kissed her. Everything will be fine, they'll figure it out. Come here, I'll set the table. After dinner, Porter sent Regina to rest. He did the dishes and then flopped onto the bed with his laptop, watching a movie with headphones on. Regina tried reading a book, but she couldn't focus. She kept thinking about Gabby, about her son. Maybe there was still time to change his mind. Regina put the book down and stared at the ceiling. Gabby. Why did she show up in their lives? Everything had been going so well. Her son finished college, got his law degree. And only Regina and Porter knew how much effort that had taken. Leo had attended one of the best schools in the city. It cost a lot of money, big money. The best teachers, cutting-edge technology, field trips, travel across the country. Then there were the tutors, also the best, charging fees that left Regina stunned. After that came college prep courses. To pay for them, they had to skip summer vacations. Then came the tuition fees. Leo didn't know how much his mother had paid to get him into a prestigious law school with a 15 to 1 competition ratio. But Regina was willing to spend even more for her son. She told herself it would all pay off in the future. Regina had been counting the days until her son graduated. She thought that once he got his diploma, their problems would be over. Just two months ago, 
she stood at his graduation, dressed beautifully, tears in her eyes, watching as her son received the degree she had dreamed of, almost as if it were her own. Then the three of them went on a vacation to Europe. Regina had always dreamed of showing her son the Czech Republic. She loved the country. She and Porter had gone there right after their wedding. During the trip, Regina couldn't stop admiring her son. Tall, handsome, with expressive eyes, just as gray as his father's. Thick eyebrows, a straight nose. And that smile. Those dimples. She felt like her life hadn't been lived in vain. After all, she'd raised such a fine young man and fulfilled her duty as a mother by giving him an excellent education. Leo had become a lawyer, fluent in two languages. From a young age, Regina had instilled a love of sports in him, he played tennis and worked out at the gym. Whenever the three of them went to the beach, Regina noticed that girls couldn't take their eyes off Leo. But Leo wasn't interested in that yet. He always said that career came first, then family. Regina had advised him not to wait too long, maybe five years focusing on work, and then think about marriage. Leo agreed and didn't rush. First, you build the foundation, then you raise the house. The foundation was already there, there was a solid sum in the bank set aside for Leo and his future wife's apartment. It wasn't quite enough for a full two-bedroom place yet, so they decided not to tell Leo about the money, planning to surprise him with the keys to his own apartment as a wedding gift. Things couldn't be better. Regina felt absolutely happy. She believed her life had turned out as perfectly as possible. And then, out of nowhere, Gabby from Frosttown appeared in their family. Leo had told them a little about his beloved. She had finished school and was now in her last year at a teacher's college. That meant she still had a year of studying left, so she wouldn't be working, and Leo would have to support her. Or Regina and Porter would, since Leo hadn't found a job yet. Regina found the latter option much more likely. What a disappointment. She and Porter had been so hopeful that they could finally fulfill all their dreams, travel to Japan, India. There were so many places in their own country they hadn't visited yet. But all those dreams were dashed. No India. No Japan. Now they had Gabby. If at least she was beautiful, Regina might have understood Leo's attraction. But this girl. What could he possibly see in her? Once upon a time, Regina had promised herself she would accept any daughter-in-law. But now it was clear she had been lying to herself. Not any daughter-in-law. Or was it her intuition screaming that Gabby would bring trouble to their family? Regina realized she needed to talk to someone. She went into the bedroom where her husband was. Porter was so engrossed in his movie that he didn't even notice her come in. Regina shook his shoulder. He startled and took off his headphones. What's wrong? Regina sat down on the bed. Did you notice? She didn't even go near the bookshelves. Who didn't? Porter asked, puzzled. Gabby. She looked around at the rugs and chandeliers. In the bathroom, I noticed my perfumes and creams weren't where I left them. So, she must have been inspecting them. But she didn't pay any attention to the books. Does she even read? Regina, Porter placed a hand on her shoulder, young people today are different. Their whole life is in their phones. If Gabby had been glued to our shelves and asked to borrow a dozen books, you'd say she picked the dumbest, most boring ones. Regina, are you going to count the spoons next, just in case she took something? You don't really suspect her of that, do you? Regina was so outraged she could barely breathe. Porter, you don't get it. Oh, I get it, he said, looking at her. Regina, she's not on our level, I understand that. But we can't stand in our son's way. And why not? What if he decides to jump off the tenth floor, would you just stand by? What if he says he's going to the forest to build a cabin and live as a hermit because freedom of choice is the most important thing? What would you say to that? Sweetheart, it's not about freedom of choice. Think about it. You're a smart woman, that's why I fell in love with you. 
Let's say you forbid him from marrying Gabby. You give him an ultimatum, it's either me or her. I have no doubt that our son would choose you. And then what? Porter went quiet. Regina knew this was his favorite tactic, letting her find the answers herself. It's how he lectured at the university too, claiming it was one of the best ways to encourage independent thinking in his students. This approach had seeped into his everyday conversations as well. At first, it annoyed Regina, but over time, she got used to it. After all, you tend to value conclusions you arrive at yourself more than those handed to you. So, I'll end up being the bad guy, she sighed. Exactly, Porter nodded. He'll spend the rest of his life thinking you tore him away from the love of his life. And no matter who he's with or who he eventually marries, that thought will always linger. What if Gabby would have been the one to make him truly happy? What if they'd lived a long, peaceful life together with five kids? So, my dear, what does that mean? It means we can't stand in his way, Regina was forced to agree. How does Porter always manage to calm her down and make her believe that everything happening is right? It's a rare talent, and maybe that's why she chose him. Exactly, dear, we can't, her husband said. Regina, forgive me, but my mother didn't like you either. She thought you weren't a good match for me. Regina smirked. Yes, that's true. When they met, Porter had already earned his PhD at just 23. He was a young genius, a talented linguist, an expert in folklore. The youngest associate professor in the department's history. His first monograph was about to be published. And Regina? She had just graduated with honors from the foreign languages faculty. But she was nothing compared to Porter. His mother was disappointed in Regina. But in the end, everything worked out. And Regina had a wonderful relationship with her mother-in-law until she passed away. Regina also had one big flaw. When she met Porter, she was already pregnant. It had been a brief but passionate affair, her first love. Her first man, who not only had no serious intentions but had hidden the fact that he was married. Porter had said it didn't matter to him and that he would accept Regina and her child. And he did. He never once reproached her. He treated Leo like his own son, loved him more than some fathers love their biological children. His mother probably had her suspicions but kept quiet. Eventually, she grew to love Regina and Leo, accepting her son's choice. Maybe Regina could find something good in Gabby too. Maybe she was kind or would be a great mother. Speaking of motherhood. Listen, do you think she might be pregnant? Regina suggested. Her husband laughed. No, I asked Leo directly. They're just in love, that's all. According to our son, she's the one and only love of his life. Regina, open your eyes. He's crazy about her. He couldn't take his eyes off her all evening. Let him go. If he's going to make a mistake, let him. Porter's words outraged Regina. Wasn't it her duty to protect her son from all the hardships of life? Besides, he was still just a kid. Wasn't it only yesterday that he started school? And the day before that, she brought home a tiny bundle who whimpered, wrinkled his nose, and raised his little eyebrows. How much effort had Regina put into him? He was always in her arms, crying as soon as she put him down. When Leo started daycare, he had a weak immune system and got sick every week. Regina took him to doctors, bought expensive vitamins, and took him to special treatments. And when he was 10, he almost died of appendicitis. She was convinced that if he died, she would follow him. Her life had no meaning without Leo. And school years? Whoever said they were the best years was lying. And then college? And now she was supposed to hand all of this over to some Gabby. That girl wouldn't even appreciate what a treasure she was getting. Gabby didn't have the brains to understand. Regina, I know what you're thinking, Porter sighed. Just let him go. He didn't get to finish. They both heard the front door open. Leo was home. 
I'll go feed him, Regina said. He must be starving. You can't live off love, even if it's your one and only, forever. Regina found Leo in the kitchen. He was standing by the stove, holding a kettle as if he'd forgotten what to do to make the water boil. Hey, sweetheart. How are you? Are you hungry? Hey, mom. I thought you'd be asleep by now. Leo put the kettle down and hugged his mother. Yeah, I'm starving. Regina sighed. His eyes were bright, his cheeks flushed, and his lips slightly swollen. He must have been kissing Gabby until he was lightheaded. It was a good thing Gabby lived in the dorm, they didn't have many chances to be alone. Otherwise, Gabby might have been walking down the aisle with a bouquet large enough to cover a pregnant belly. Although, if they wanted to, they'd find a way. And Leo seemed to want it badly. He'd never been this in love before. Sure, there had been girls he brought home, but his eyes never sparkled like this, and he never had that dreamy, absent look. What on earth was so special about Gabby? Regina heated up some chicken for her son, set the plate in front of him, carefully arranged the utensils, and placed a napkin. Regina had always believed that meals should be presented beautifully. Eating was a ritual. She'd carefully chosen the dishes, luxurious colors, fine porcelain. No cheap cups or plates. No low-quality products. She wondered, would Gabby treat food the same way? Or would she just serve Leo a plate of sticky pasta drowned in ketchup? How long would Leo be able to put up with that? He had no idea things could be different from how they were at home. He hadn't seen anything else. How many surprises were waiting for Leo? Regina felt genuine pity for her son. But Porter was right. It was his choice, his mistake. And Regina had no doubt that marrying Gabby would be a mistake. Well, no matter. As Nicole said, they'd eventually get divorced, and then he'd be wiser. But oh, how Regina wished he didn't have to go through all of this. If only his life could flow smoothly, with no pain, no heartbreak, no sadness. She wished she could take all that on herself and leave her son with only happiness. Regina sat across from Leo. How handsome he was. But who did he get it from? She was attractive, of course, but pretty average. Leo's biological father, whom Regina preferred not to think about, wasn't exactly handsome either. Yet somehow, everything had mixed together perfectly with Leo, like a skilled chef creating a masterpiece from simple ingredients. And what about Gabby? Did she look like her parents? Were they as plain as she was? Regina thought that Leo and Gabby were like two birds. In the bird world, the males are usually bright, beautiful, and eye-catching, while the females are almost always gray. So what was it about Gabby that had won him over? Leo finished dinner, thanked his mom, and went to his room. A minute later, Regina heard his soft voice. Yes, my sweet, I've already eaten. Of course. And you? What are you doing? Regina cringed at the words. Sweet. Seriously. She washed the dishes, took a shower, and went to bed. Porter was already half asleep, wrapped up in the blanket. Regina settled in beside him. Maybe, in a decent family, Gabby could become someone respectable. Maybe she could be raised to a higher level. Regina needed to find out where Leo had met her. After all, none of the girls from college had caught his eye. There were such lovely girls there, many of whom Regina would have loved to see as her daughter-in-law. Mia, for example, the daughter of a gas station chain owner. Or Tamala, whose parents were both notaries. And she clearly liked Leo. It was obvious to anyone. But no, Leo was like a cat that had been fed premium food his whole life, and suddenly decided to eat out of a trash can. Regina fell asleep with difficulty, wanting to cry out of frustration and resentment. But somehow, things would work out. Friday flew by unnoticed. Leo ran off to another interview, saying he'd be back late. 
which probably meant he'd be out with Gabby until late at night. Regina was working on another translation. The publisher had sent her a novel by a trendy Korean author that needed to be finished urgently. They told her it should have been done by tomorrow, or even better, yesterday. But work wasn't helping to distract her. If anything, it made things worse. The book described the life of the aristocracy, and Regina couldn't help but think how wisely things were arranged in Korea. Marriages within one's own class. Some might think it's unfair, of course. That all people are equal, and love knows no boundaries. Of course, love knows no age, it forgives all, and it's the meaning of life. Who would dare argue with that? But what about differences in mentality, in culture, in education? Sooner or later, that's bound to come out. And no love will be able to save it. Gabby and Leo were just not a match. Not a match at all. Saturday was the day of the trip to Frosttown. Leo had been anxious since the morning. He went through three different t-shirts, but none of them felt right. Then he decided to wear a shirt and grab the iron. He didn't trust his mom to do the ironing this time, he wanted to handle it himself and almost burned a hole in the fabric. Regina sent her husband to help Leo while she stood frozen in front of her closet. What should she wear? Her favorite silk dress. It was beautiful, a soft green with a knee-length skirt and straight sleeves. No, that was too much. A business suit. No, too formal. She wasn't going to meet the queen, after all, just Gabby's parents from Frosttown. The mere thought of that family soured her mood. Finally, Regina settled on a pair of straight summer palazzo pants and a light cream silk blouse with a bow on the chest. She had bought the blouse in New York last summer when she attended an event for the publishing house she worked for. Those were good times. Leo was still in college and apparently hadn't met Gabby yet. Everything had happened so fast. He didn't even say where they met. She should probably ask him. Regina realized she hadn't appreciated the time when Gabby wasn't part of her life. Her husband peeked into the room and smiled. You look great. Not too much. Regina looked thoughtfully at her reflection, adjusting the bow. Do you think I should wear earrings or not? You look good in anything, my love, Porter said, coming up to Regina and wrapping his arms around her waist, but even better without. He kissed her neck, and Regina closed her eyes in pleasure. Now, now, my dear, she purred, has Leo already gone outside? Yes, he's waiting by the car, her husband replied. Then, please, don't distract me, Porter. And get ready yourself. I've already ironed your shirt. Ten minutes later, they left the house. Regina decided to wear the earrings after all. Leo was incredibly nervous. He hadn't been this anxious even before exams. Regina felt genuine sympathy for her son. Leo, have you already met them, she asked. Her son shot her a wild look and then nodded. Yeah, we visited last month. Regina felt hurt. Her son had started hiding such important events from her. Of course, Gabby had appeared, and now she was Leo's priority. His own mother didn't need to be informed anymore. Porter seemed to read his wife's thoughts and glanced at her with a light smile, as if to say, don't worry, dear. You've got me, and that's what matters. So, how was it? Regina asked. Leo just shrugged and unbuttoned the top button of his shirt. It was fine, mom. I liked them. Leo rebut-toned the shirt again. Regina feared that by the end of the trip, he might rip the button off entirely. What do they do for work, dear? What's their occupation? Regina pressed on. We're about to become family, after all. I'm curious. Her mom's gone, Leo said. It's just her dad and aunt. Her aunt raised her, and they live together. Regina suddenly felt ashamed for all her bad thoughts about Gabby. No mother. Ever since Leo was born, Regina had been terrified that something would happen to her. She wasn't scared of dying, 
she was scared of leaving her son alone in this big, dangerous world, where no one would love him the way she did. Leo didn't tell his mother anything more. Apparently, he didn't want to. Maybe he was embarrassed, or just too nervous. What was he so afraid of? That his parents would grimace at the sight of Gabby's family? Although. Regina remembered how nervous she had been before meeting her future mother-in-law for the first time. But that was different. By then, Regina's pregnancy was already noticeable, and Porter had been worried when they decided to introduce their parents. To be honest, those meetings didn't go well. Porter's mother hadn't liked Regina from the start, and Regina's parents found his mother arrogant and unpleasant. But she still felt sorry for Leo. Regina even thought about suggesting they go to the city beach instead of Frosttown. She used to take Leo there as a child whenever he was upset. But that probably wouldn't work now. Regina made a mental note to herself to be friendly, even if Gabby's relatives turned out to be alcoholics. All that mattered was that her Leo, her only son, didn't get upset. God, being a mother was so hard. Finally, they arrived. It turned out that Gabby's father and aunt lived in an old house. When Regina saw it, she frowned. A crooked little fence, a couple of apple and plum trees, and some empty jars scattered on the porch. The aunt was probably getting ready to make preserves for the winter. The house, in general, looked poor and a little neglected. Porter leaned over to Regina's ear and whispered. Try to relax your face a bit, my love. Is it that obvious? Regina asked. Oh, yes. Regina, please, for Leo's sake. Regina nodded. She had to try. Leo had been on edge the entire trip. If he noticed his mother's shock at Gabby's family's living conditions, it would be a disaster. Regina didn't want to cause her son any emotional trauma that he'd have to discuss with a therapist later. Too bad Leo didn't worry about his mother the same way. He had brought Gabby into their lives and expected them to accept it without question. A plump woman in a brightly colored dress rushed out of the house. Regina sighed. This was probably her best outfit. These were the kind of clothes usually worn by women of modest means, cheap and comfortable. Plain cotton knitwear. Regina would never allow herself to wear something like that. It was always either an elegant pajama set or a silk robe. Porter wouldn't understand if Regina started walking around the house in such attire. Who even comes up with these horrible patterns? What is wrong with these people's taste? Mom, see? They're already greeting us, Leo said. Oh, our guests have arrived. The woman ran up to Regina, hugged her, and kissed both her cheeks. I've been expecting you. I even baked a pie. Do you eat pie? Regina didn't eat pies. She had given up flour products ten years ago. But she didn't want to upset her son. Yes, I do. Thank you, she smiled. I'd love to try it. Come inside, why are you all standing here? My name's Lisa, by the way. I'm Gabby's aunt. Nice to meet you. I'm Porter, her husband extended his hand. And this is my wife, Regina. Lisa shook Porter's hand with some odd enthusiasm, staring into his eyes, then practically dragged Regina into the house. Regina followed, trying not to stumble. She should have worn boots, not heels. Inside, to Regina's surprise, it was clean and even cozy, though clearly modest. The rug in the living room reminded her of one her grandmother used to have. Exactly the same, and even back then, Regina remembered it being worn and faded. The furniture was old, and the shelves were filled with crystal bowls, piles of cups, and porcelain figurines. If Regina had been a fan of vintage, she might have been thrilled, but old things only reminded her of poverty and the inability to afford what you truly want. While examining the crystal bowls, Regina didn't notice Gabby enter the room. She immediately ran to Leo and threw her arms around his neck. How bold! On someone else's turf, she acted all shy, but here she was, kissing him without a care. 
and Leo wasn't resisting. Regina felt embarrassed for her son. But Lisa seemed to pay no attention to the display. Gabby greeted the guests, then whisked Leo away to some other part of the house. Lisa watched them leave with a smile. They're young, so beautiful, aren't they? Yes, very, Regina agreed. You can't take your eyes off them. Sorry, Nigel had to run to the store. He'll be back soon. He's bringing more for the table. I've already set things up in the kitchen, come on in. Porter decided to take the lead, complimenting the house, saying it looked solid and built to last. Lisa proudly shared that the house was almost a hundred years old and would likely stand for another century. Porter handed her a bottle of wine. Lisa admitted she'd never tasted or even seen such a wine before. No wonder, it was a special bottle Porter had brought back from Australia three years ago. Where in Frosttown could Lisa have come across something like that? Had she ever been anywhere outside this town? Finally, Gabby's father, Nigel, returned. Regina liked him even less than Lisa. He was thin, bald, sinewy, with a deep tan and a piercing, stern look. Not many people could probably hold his gaze, Regina realized right away. What had happened to him to make him look at everyone like that? But Nigel's sternness was only in his eyes. His behavior was rather friendly. He immediately invited Porter to go fishing, saying he'd take the new in-laws to a forest lake in the fall and show them how it's done. Regina imagined herself in rubber boots, holding a fishing rod, and it made her laugh. No, thank you. If she wanted fish, she could easily buy it at the supermarket. Lisa had laid out a spread in the kitchen. A few plates of pies, some pickles, and several types of salads. Regina initially planned to try a little bit of everything, not to offend the hostess. But it turned out that Lisa was an amazing cook. The pie melted in her mouth, the vegetables tasted far better than store-bought ones, and Regina even ate five of the pickles, crisp and perfectly salted. Maybe that's what won Leo over. If Gabby could cook like this, Regina might be willing to forgive her lack of education and plain appearance. Twenty minutes into the meal, Leo and Gabby finally returned to the table. Leo's hair was tousled, there was a noticeable red mark on his neck, and his shirt was wrinkled. Regina felt a wave of discomfort. Really? Was their passion so intense that they couldn't even go an hour without jumping on each other? And Gabby, with her wide grin and sparkling eyes, looked at Regina with a triumphant gaze, as if asking, so, whose Leo is he now? Mine. You know he's mine, and that's not going to change. Lisa and Nigel acted as though they hadn't noticed a thing, or if they had, they weren't aware of what the young couple had been up to in the other room. Regina thought back to how she and Porter used to behave around their parents. They could barely look at each other back then, let alone hold hands. Even that felt scandalous. But Leo? She had worked so hard to instill manners in him, and for what? Gabby came along and undid years of her efforts in no time. The young couple sat at the table for a short while before disappearing again. Regina watched her son's retreating back, tears welling up in her eyes. He was slipping away from her. Slipping away for good. Her little boy, her beloved child. So, shall we get down to business? Nigel suggested. Yes, I think it's time, Porter agreed. Leo told us that he and Gabby are planning to get married. Lisa sniffled. She's so young, my little girl. Oh, come on, Nigel's eyes suddenly softened as he gently patted Lisa on the shoulder. Don't worry so much. You can see they're good people. I'm sorry about her, she's just so concerned for Gabby. Yes, Lisa nodded. I practically raised her myself. She was so little when she came to live with me. Regina sighed. Well, that's something. At least Lisa and I agree on one thing, this wedding is too rushed and thoughtless. They need to spend at least another five years thinking about it before they go through with it. Sorry again, we're just simple people, Nigel said with a smile. 
We were surprised too when Gabby told us everything. We thought she'd finish college first, but look how it turned out. But you know, there's no point in arguing with them. Yeah, Regina added, but they're definitely rushing into this. Maybe so, Nigel agreed. But no one knows how things will turn out. They might stay together forever, who knows. So, what do you think about the wedding? Where do you want to hold it? Who should be invited? Of course, we'll split the costs. We don't have a lot, but we won't be stingy for Gabby's wedding. We've been saving up for an occasion like this. They discussed the upcoming celebration for almost two hours. Lisa kept breaking into tears. Regina increasingly wanted to stand up and scream that there would be no wedding, and there could be none. Porter and Nigel managed to stay rational and slowly reached a consensus. Regina didn't even want to think about what Gabby and Leo were up to. Why should they worry? The adults would handle everything and foot the bill. Regina remembered her own wedding. They didn't have much money. At that time, she earned more than her husband. He had a modest salary as a school teacher, while she was already working with a publishing house and doing translations. They didn't take a penny from their parents. The wedding was modest but joyful. First, the ceremony, then a trip with friends to a lake. Regina bought a short white dress and thought her long legs would be a better decoration than silk and lace. In that very dress, she and Porter jumped into the lake hand in hand. To this day, a photo of them, wet and hugging, hangs above their bed. It's hard to believe how many years have passed since then. It was unlikely Leo and Gabby would agree to a lakeside wedding. And how could she refuse her only son? He's naive and believes this will be his one and only wedding, and that he and Gabby will walk hand in hand through life together. It's laughable. Anyway, the decision was soon made, minimal relatives and friends, definitely a restaurant. Lisa insisted she could handle cooking for 50 people, but Nigel put a stop to that. I don't want you to overdo it. Let others handle the cooking, and you should relax. Regina offered to buy the dress herself. We can go shopping together, she suggested to Lisa, who was starting to grow on her. Let Gabby pick out what she likes. Oh, I'm not good at that, Lisa smiled. You two go together. Look at you, dressed so well. I see flowers and lace, and everything looks pretty to me. Regina was surprised. Lisa wasn't lacking in self-awareness and a bit of self-irony. Regina appreciated those qualities in people. If Lisa had received a good education in her time, maybe her life would have turned out better. Finally, it was time to head home. Leo announced that he would be staying overnight at his fiancé's house. Regina frowned and asked. Darling, can I talk to you for a minute? They stepped outside together. Leo had a goofy smile on his face. Regina felt like giving him a light smack on the head, just enough to snap him out of it. Leo, what do you mean you're staying here? Don't you have a home? And this is inappropriate, after all. Mom, I've stayed over at their place tons of times, Leo said. Lisa doesn't mind. How many times? Well, a few, Leo shrugged. So what? I'm more than 18 now, I have the right. Regina felt uneasy. Maybe her suspicions were correct, and Gabby really is pregnant. Maybe that's why they're rushing into the wedding. Gabby's family comes from a small town where it's still customary for children to be born within a legal marriage. The key is to find a dress that can stretch over a growing belly before it's too late. Mom, please, I'll come home by train in the morning, Leo pleaded. Regina couldn't help but smile. Just a few seconds ago, he was an independent adult, and now he's begging to stay over at his girlfriend's place, acting like he's ten years old again. And he thinks he's ready to take responsibility for a family? Oh, God, help me. Just tell me where I went wrong and why I'm being tested this way. Fine, stay, Regina said, waving her hand. Just be careful, please. Remember what I told you about all this. Yeah, I remember, Leo said, 
beaming. The rest of the family came out of the house, Lisa, Nigel, and Gabby. Gabby immediately threw herself at Leo. Nigel and Porter shook hands and talked about fishing. Was Porter really going to go? Lisa kissed Regina goodbye and handed her two bags filled with containers. There's a pie and some other goodies in there, she said. Regina accepted the bags with genuine gratitude. Porter and Regina got into the car and drove down the dirt road. The sunset was stunning. The sky turned orange on the horizon, clouds turned golden and pink. On the other side, a dark cloud was rolling in. It looked like it would rain tonight. Regina felt as though nature was showing her life before and after. Before, the golden clouds and serene happiness. After, a storm cloud in the form of Gabby, who plans to take away Regina's most precious thing, her son Leo. So, what do you think? Regina asked her husband. She already knew what he thought. After more than twenty years together, it's only natural to be able to read each other's minds. Good people. Porter shrugged. Maybe the girl's not so bad either. Lisa loves her so much. Nigel said she's been raising her since she was five. Children who grow up with total love are either really good and kind or complete egoists, Regina observed. Well, maybe. And you've spoiled Leo too, Porter replied. Really? Tell me more about how I'm to blame. Tears welled up in Regina's eyes again. You're the father, you could set an example. Instead, the first girl who ends up in his bed, and he says he's made her his wife. Regina, don't. They're in love. Gabby looks at Leo like a puppy. You know how I feel about Leo and wish him nothing but the best. I think he'll be happy with this girl. And if not, well, what can you do? They'll get divorced. Life doesn't end after a divorce. Regina turned away and stared out the window. The sun had disappeared, the sky darkened. Light rain started to fall. At home, Regina took a shower and called Nicole. She needed to vent. Nicole listened to Regina and said. Well, they're normal people. Lisa seems like a good woman, a homemaker, judging by your story. Yeah, a homemaker, Regina sighed. Nicole, Leo's father is a professor, author of textbooks and monographs. His mother is a translator, by the way, well known in certain circles. We live in a nice apartment. We have an education. So why did Leo end up in Frosttown? Stop whining and get ready for the wedding, Nicole suggested. You'll calm down a bit once you have grandchildren and might even accept Gabby. A week later, preparations for the wedding began. Regina went shopping with Gabby. She wanted to dress modestly to avoid overshadowing her future daughter-in-law, but then changed her mind. The girl should know what kind of family she's marrying into. So Regina chose her best dress, the green one. Gabby showed up in jeans and a silly t-shirt with some unknown yellow creature with bulging eyes. Regina had to work hard not to comment on her outfit. After all, she was only twenty, still a child. Maybe she still watches cartoons. Leo does too, though he's a bit embarrassed about it. And now these two kids are going to start a family. Seriously? They took a long time picking out a dress. Gabby started showing her true colors. She immediately said she wouldn't settle for a cheap dress. What do you mean by that? Regina asked her. Well, you know, Gabby gestured around her waist. With all these skirts and puffy corsets. I want something elegant. Regina was very curious about what Gabby meant by elegant. During the fitting, it turned out that Gabby wanted a dress with off-the-shoulder sleeves. By the evening, after what felt like an endless search, they finally found the dress. They had to visit about ten stores, and in each one, Gabby tried on two or three dresses. Regina sometimes wanted to snap at her or tell her to just pick whatever fit and stop being so fussy. Regina was exhausted, but she didn't want to ruin Gabby's special moment. 
It wasn't Gabby's fault she was from a poor family or that she had such an unremarkable appearance. Why did Leo choose her? Why? In the evening, Regina sent Gabby off in a taxi and decided to visit Nicole. They chatted for a bit. Nicole complained about her husband who had gone on another business trip, leaving her to manage work and their daughter alone for a whole month. Regina pretended to sympathize, though she knew Nicole's problems were nothing compared to her own. When she got home, she felt conflicted, angry at Gabby and yet feeling sorry for her. She wondered what had happened to her mother. It was awkward to ask directly. But no matter, they would all become one happy family. Time flew by as the wedding approached. Regina found an outfit for herself, a long, almost floor-length skirt and a blouse in her favorite silk with lace at the neckline, all in a soft, cream color. They also found a suit for Leo. When her son emerged from the fitting room, Regina broke down in tears for the first time during all the wedding preparations. It was really happening. A week before the wedding, which would be joyous for everyone and tragic for Regina, she learned that the young couple planned to live in the groom's parents' apartment. Regina had assumed they would rent a place of their own, but Leo thought it was unnecessary to leave his room. He announced this news at dinner. Son, what do you mean? Regina asked, surprised. Mom, what's the big deal? I'm just starting my job and can't afford a place yet. Gabby is studying. We'll manage here. We have three rooms, we'll make it work. But wait, dear, what does Gabby think about this? Regina asked cautiously. She agrees. Leo smiled, not sensing any hidden meaning in his mother's question. Of course, she would agree. After starting in an old house in a small town and then living in a dorm, it would be surprising if she didn't like their three-room apartment. But Regina didn't want her future daughter-in-law moving in. She adored that apartment, it was her nest, her creation. She had chosen all the furniture herself, from the coffee table to the shelves, and had come to think of herself as the sole rightful owner. And the kitchen. Her beloved kitchen, designed exactly how she liked it. And the refrigerator. Would she have to share her little piece of the Arctic with Gabby? Regina felt like crying from self-pity. When she and Porter first got married, they lived in a tiny apartment with just one room. It had been inherited from her father, who had died when she was just ten. Her mother had an extra room, but Regina couldn't bear the thought of living with her. She was now a married woman, with her own family, her own home, and her own life. Later, they sold that old apartment and bought a new one-bedroom place. Regina was thrilled to have her own spacious bathroom and a beautiful kitchen where she could entertain guests. Things started looking up. Porter published his first textbook and began getting invitations to lecture at universities. Their apartment turned into a three-room place, his and hers, not Gabby's. Porter nudged Regina with his foot. He often joked that his wife had a face with subtitles, and he could easily read her thoughts. Fortunately, Leo was too caught up in his own excitement to notice his mother's feelings. He was an adult now, soon to be a real husband, so he paid no attention to her emotions and continued to talk. Mom, it's not far from college for her. Aren't you okay with that? Dad, Mom? Regina gave Porter a look he always understood, a silent warning that said, stop it, or else. But Porter shrugged and continued drinking his tea. After dinner, Leo went to his room to call his beloved. What? Why do they have to live with us? Regina hissed. Regina, what's the big deal? Porter raised an eyebrow in surprise. Everyone starts somewhere. Remember our wedding gift to Leo? We can give him money for an apartment then. Regina shot her husband a look of pure anger. He was a genius, but sometimes he didn't understand the basics. They'll buy an apartment. They'll buy it while they're married, Porter. Yeah, so. You want Gabby to claim half the apartment if they divorce? Porter, you're smart, but sometimes. Listen, you're overestimating this girl's abilities. Regina, please think about it. 
It's better if they're close by. You can teach her good taste in cooking. You know what they say. A wise mother-in-law gains a daughter, a foolish one loses a son. Don't be. I'm not foolish, Regina pouted. I understand, but you just love Leo too much, and it's driving you crazy. Sweetheart, even if you were 30, you'd still worry. Let's go to bed, they won't be a bother. Time flew by. Before Regina knew it, the wedding day had arrived, a black day for her. For moral support, she invited Nicole. Regina wouldn't have been able to get through this without her. Lisa was crying at the ceremony, while Nigel remained as calm as a rock. Regina shed a tear, but not from happiness, because her boy was marrying Gabby. Although, in her wedding dress and makeup, Gabby did look decent. She had lightened her hair to a pleasant blonde. Regina had paid for the salon, as her son had asked. She looks decent, Nicole commented after the ceremony. The newlyweds were taking pictures, and the guests were breaking off into small groups. Porter went over to Nigel, probably to talk about fishing. Yeah, but with money, anyone can look decent, Regina replied bitterly. I had to invest in this girl. Ha, look how Leo is glowing, Nicole said, trying to lighten the mood. Regina, why don't you calm down? I am calm, Regina growled. Absolutely calm. Regina, don't be mad at him, be mad at yourself, Nicole said, patting Regina's shoulder. You know, I read somewhere that a son brings home the upbringing of his mother. What you instilled in him is what he chose. I don't understand what you mean, Regina raised an eyebrow. You mean? Who shaped his taste? You did, Nicole shrugged. Well, I really don't like her, Nicole. There's something about her that's, you know, off-putting, Regina sighed. Oh, it's only off-putting because she's marrying your son, Nicole laughed. Next was the reception. The newlyweds danced and took more pictures. Regina downed one glass of champagne after another. She felt a pang of sadness for her son. She watched as Gabby, who didn't seem as simple as she looked, took control. She was pulling Leo around, nudging him to kiss her. And Leo complied, to everyone's cooing delight. Gabby embraced him possessively. That girl was going to make waves. Finally, the guests began to leave. Regina realized that soon they would be going home. But not as a trio, as usual, but as a quartet. Gabby was now part of their family, and there was nothing to be done about it. No more happy evenings walking home from the theater or movies with just Porter and Leo. Gabby would always be around, and she would always irritate Regina. The woman was terrified of becoming a terrible mother-in-law, terrified because she had her own bad experiences. It took her three years to earn not love but at least respect from her own mother-in-law. And she succeeded. She proved that she was a good wife and a wonderful mother. But would Gabby win Regina's love? It didn't seem so. Gabby never even approached Regina once. She chose an expensive wedding dress, immediately going for models that cost more than a month's salary for her and her family. Yeah, this country girl knows her worth maybe even too well. But there was nothing to be done. Gabby was now Leo's wife. They called a taxi. Leo was dozing off, probably tired and overwhelmed. Gabby was holding his hand tightly. Regina just stared out the window. A new life was beginning. Regina had allocated a shelf in the fridge for Gabby, which surprised Leo. He thought his parents would still cook for everyone, including Gabby. Regina had to explain to her son that since he decided to get married, he was now an adult and should eat what his wife prepared, not what his mother made. Leo didn't like that. I don't have a job yet, he said. We got money as wedding gifts, but we wanted to go somewhere. Leo, if you're not working, then you're not going anywhere, Regina said, frowning. It pained her to say this, it was her little boy. She would give him everything, all her money, her apartment, even her own life. But it couldn't be helped. Sometimes, one needs to be tough. 
Leo wasn't used to this. He was hurt. Porter was also unhappy with Regina. Why are you treating him like that? Why not set boundaries in the apartment? Like, this is your side, and this is ours. Darling, otherwise, they'll just sit around and do nothing. Only entertain themselves in bed, Regina said. For the first week, nothing happened. Leo and Gabby stayed in their room, only coming out in the evening for a walk. They ordered food to be delivered. Regina wondered how long their wedding gifts would last. Fortunately, by September, Leo found a job. That was one less problem. Gabby started her final year of college, but she skipped classes, spent time on the computer, or lay in bed napping. Regina was irritated. Didn't she plan to get her degree? Did she think she already had everything she needed? Was it normal for a young woman to sleep until noon? They had agreed that Gabby would at least clean and do her own laundry. But no, she just piled her dirty clothes in a separate bin in the bathroom. Regina didn't want to do the laundry for the newlyweds, but she had to when the pile became too big. She scolded Gabby a couple of times. Gabby nodded and promised to change, but nothing improved. And Gabby didn't cook at all. Leo lived on instant noodles. Regina had a hard time not intervening and convincing Porter not to feed their son, otherwise, it would just continue. She did it for her child. She was trying to reform this young family. Nicole didn't support Regina's disciplinary measures. She thought Regina was just angry and jealous. Regina, your family. Nicole said. And you're acting like a child. This is my toy, that's yours. But Regina was sure she was doing the right thing. One morning, when Porter and Leo had already left for work, Regina woke up to strange noises. She didn't immediately understand what it was. Then she realized Gabby was throwing up in the bathroom. Regina put on a robe and went to see what was happening. The bathroom door was unlocked. Gabby was sitting on the floor. What's wrong? Do you need me to call an ambulance? Regina sat down next to Gabby. Did you get food poisoning? Gabby shook her head. No, it's something else. Are you sure, Gabby? Yes, I'm sure, Gabby said weakly, managing a faint smile. We didn't want to tell you. Regina looked at her daughter-in-law in surprise. Are you pregnant? Yes, Gabby nodded. Four months along. A grandchild. Regina was going to have a grandchild. She felt a slight dizziness. She knew this would happen sooner or later, but so soon. She also felt ashamed. She had criticized Gabby for being lazy, for lying in bed all day, not doing anything around the house. And this was the real reason. Regina herself had barely moved during her early pregnancy. She only had enough energy to get to the kitchen and quickly prepare lunch and dinner. Gabby, let me make you some tea. You know, salty foods helped me. Regina got up and offered Gabby her hand. Have you seen a doctor? Yes, I've already had an ultrasound. Gabby struggled to get up, pale with dark circles under her eyes. Regina found herself feeling genuinely sorry for her daughter-in-law. Nicole was right, Regina had become bitter. So, she was going to have a grandchild. A grandchild. It seemed strange to even think about it, considering she wasn't even 50 yet. And now she had a real grandchild. Regina's heart ached sweetly. She would once again rock a baby, kiss tiny toes, and breathe in the incomparable milky scent of baby hair. She had always loved children. She wanted two or even three. But when Leo was born, she changed her mind, fearing that her son might feel neglected and not get the attention he deserved. So she decided against having a second child. And when she became pregnant a second time, she had an abortion. One of the worst memories of her life. Then Regina's mother fell ill, something with her kidneys. The doctors couldn't do anything. Regina fell into a deep depression, unable to grasp what was happening, and even her son didn't cheer her up. 
that's when everything happened by chance. She didn't even realize she was pregnant at first, and when she did, she dealt with the problem. She still couldn't figure out if she did the right thing back then. Maybe she should have had the baby. But it was too late to change anything. Regina was convinced it would have been a girl. But what choice did she have? Porter wanted a child, a little one of his own. But he was afraid they wouldn't have enough money, and a baby would interfere with his work. Porter was supposed to be releasing a new monograph. But now they would have a grandson. Or granddaughter. Regina forgave Gabby everything. She started cooking for the whole family, doing the laundry, and never mentioning that Gabby could have done the laundry herself. Regina went with Gabby to doctor's appointments. However, problems started quickly. Gabby was moody, refused to get up early for blood tests, avoided nutritious foods, and ate chips. One day, Regina caught her daughter-in-law smoking. She smelled the smoke and found Gabby at the window. Gabby, what are you doing? Gabby quickly threw the cigarette out the window without even putting it out. I just wanted some fresh air. You were smoking. Do you even understand how bad that is for the baby? The baby suffocating when you inhale that crap. The baby will be fine. Gabby sighed. I just got a bit stressed. I should calm down, I won't do it again. Regina was scared by Gabby's attitude toward her pregnancy and the baby. When Regina was expecting Leo, she followed every doctor's recommendation as if her life depended on it. Vitamins, daily walks, exercise. Regina ate vegetables and good meat. She read the ingredients on every yogurt and cookie package. Heaven forbid any carcinogen or harmful dye got into her system. She didn't allow anyone to smoke around her. Porter had given up smoking back then. Regina was even irritated by the smell of tobacco coming from her husband. And now this. Maybe some women don't even have a hint of maternal instincts. Gabby might be one of them. But Regina didn't have the energy to argue with Gabby. She constantly felt unwell, as if she were pregnant herself. Regina felt nauseous and sleepy. It was getting harder and harder to work, Regina was growing weaker, and as a result, she became irritable. She didn't understand what was happening to her. She argued with Porter. Her husband started spending evenings away from home to avoid being with Regina. Porter thought it was all about Gabby. You're losing your mind over her, dear, he sighed. Accept the fact that our son is an adult, and this is his choice. But Regina couldn't accept Leo's choice. Gabby irritated her more and more with her carelessness, lack of desire to do anything around the house, and even the fact that she was pregnant. Maybe she got pregnant on purpose so that Leo couldn't escape. Now they were bound forever. Even if they divorced, Leo would have to pay alimony. Leo started distancing himself from his mother. This wasn't surprising. Regina was angry with him, often yelling during their conversations. Naturally, her son preferred his wife's company. Nicole noticed something was wrong too. During their next walk, she said. Listen, friend, you seem like a different person. In what sense, Nicole? What don't you like? You've become so bitter. You only complain about Gabby. Relax a bit. Go somewhere, or see a therapist. They say it helps. Regina glared at her friend. Nicole, you've never been through this, so you wouldn't understand. I'm shaking from this girl. I have to clean the bathroom after her. It's so disgusting. She smokes in the kitchen, everything stinks. And Leo and Porter don't care. What kind of baby will she have? Sick, you'll see. Well, you're right about the smoking, Nicole said, but about the rest, Regina, she's just young and inexperienced. Teach her, explain how things should be. She grew up without a mother, so she might not know how to behave properly. Regina didn't want to teach Gabby anything. She just wanted her to disappear, and for Leo to forget his wife forever. There was something off about Gabby. Sure, 
She looked at Leo with loving eyes, held his hand, but the moment he turned away, Gabby's expression would change. Her gaze would become cold, almost angry, and her smile would vanish. Something about her wasn't right. If only she knew what it was. Though, why wonder? Regina was sure of one thing, to Gabby, Leo was just a way to improve her life without lifting a finger. But what about Porter? Why did he like her so much? He was already calling her, daughter, even giving her spending money. Still, there was one small positive. Gabby had started cooking, and she wasn't bad at it. That was a relief for Regina. She didn't have the energy to cook anymore. She had missed deadlines on her translation work and had to turn down a good project. Nicole was worried about her friend's condition, insisting that Regina should see a doctor. But Regina refused. It was just stress, nothing more. When Gabby was seven months pregnant, she convinced Leo to take a vacation by the sea, saying she needed the fresh air. Leo borrowed money from his father and bought the tickets. That also made Regina furious. Porter had always refused to go anywhere with her, claiming they needed to save money. But when Gabby wanted a trip, the money suddenly appeared. Regina was upset with her husband all day. By evening, it had escalated into a full-blown argument. Regina couldn't even remember how it started. She said something about Gabby's insatiable appetite, and Porter immediately snapped, accusing Regina of being heartless. He said the poor girl had grown up without a mother, and she was treating her like a wicked witch. That night, Regina went to bed in a terrible mood. She made up the couch for herself, not wanting to sleep next to her husband. Her instincts had been right all along. Gabby had come into their family and caused a rift. And yet, she seemed so quiet, so modest, always looking down at the floor. Maybe Regina was the odd one out in this family now. The three of them seemed so happy together. Maybe it would be best if she just disappeared, stopped ruining everyone's life. Regina cried a little before finally falling asleep. When she woke up, she didn't recognize where she was at first. The ceiling above her was grayish, not like the white suspended ceilings in their apartment. This one was old and stained. Regina tried to move, but she couldn't, as if something was holding her arms and legs. She wanted to break free but couldn't. Then she felt a light pain in her arm and drifted back into sleep, a heavy, oppressive sleep, like a lead weight. This cycle of waking and falling back into the same heavy sleep happened several times. Regina lost track of how many. Her mind refused to process what was going on. Sometimes, when she woke up, she thought about Leo and Porter and would start to cry. She had the feeling that someone was speaking to her. Then, suddenly, it got easier. She woke up with a clear head. It felt strange, a long-forgotten sensation. She tried to sit up, and this time she could. Regina. Regina jolted awake. A man in a white coat was sitting next to her. He had a long gray beard and neatly trimmed mustache. For some reason, Regina's gaze was fixated on his mustache as if it were the center of her world, and she couldn't look away. Hmm, the woman rasped. The man nodded. How old are you? Forty-five. What happened? The man winced. Do you know what day it is? The date? Regina frowned. She didn't know the day or the date. It frightened her. No. Have I been asleep for a long time? I have a deadline. I need to write a letter or make a call. Later, Regina. Do you remember anything? Remember what? Anything from before you were hospitalized. The man sighed. We tried talking to you before, but you seem to be delirious. Really? What's going on? I don't understand. Regina felt a surge of anger. Strange. It seemed she had completely forgotten what anger felt like. Regina, I'm your doctor. My name is Samuel, he said with a slight smile, his mustache curling up at the ends. You're in a psychiatric hospital. 
What? she exclaimed. No, that can't be. This must be a dream. Regina thought she'd wake up in her own bed next to Porter, make breakfast for him and Leo. Leo would go to work, and Porter would sit down to work on his latest article or prepare for a lecture. My doctor. Yes, that's right. We've reduced your medication because you were acting aggressively, but I decided to bring you out of that state so we could talk. Do you remember anything? No, nothing, Regina rubbed her temples. How did I get here? You had a seizure, the doctor replied vaguely. If you don't remember, I won't push you. Just rest. If you need anything, press the button next to your bed. Someone will come immediately. For now, just rest. He stood up and walked toward the door. Regina wanted to stop him, but she didn't have the strength. The door closed, and she heard the click of a lock. She realized she was in a prison. Regina looked around. The room was tiny. There was just a bed and a barred window near the ceiling. Had she been kidnapped? Where was her husband? What about her son? Why was she alone? Why was no one visiting her? Regina tried to get up but collapsed back onto the pillow and fell asleep. The next few days passed in a fog. She would fall asleep and then wake up. It seemed like people came to see her, but Regina couldn't recognize them. They asked her questions, but she didn't know the answers. Where were you? What were you doing? Do you remember what happened? Regina couldn't remember anything. She remembered arguing with Porter about money. She remembered falling asleep on the couch, wrapped in a blanket. Then, a void. Then, clarity came. Nicole arrived. Her friend looked strange, dressed in all black with tear-swollen eyes. Regina had only seen her like this once before, when Nicole's father had died. Nicole sat in a chair by Regina's bed and took her hand. How are you? Do you remember me? I do, Regina replied, surprised. Shouldn't I? I don't know, Nicole said with a trembling voice. I don't know anything anymore. Listen. Do you remember anything at all? What are you talking about? Regina clenched her fists, and Nicole flinched. What's going on? No, Regina, nothing. I just came to tell you something. We spoke with the doctor, and he thinks this is for the best. Oh God, Nicole, what happened? Why am I here? I'm scared. Where's Porter? Where's Leo? A tear rolled down Regina's cheek. I don't understand, Nicole. Regina, hang in there, Nicole swallowed nervously. And I'm sorry, but you need to know. Just tell me already. Regina felt her heart turn to ice. A shiver ran down her skin, and her temples tightened. Nicole, what are they hiding from me? Regina, Porter is in the hospital in very serious condition. You you tried to kill him. What? Regina couldn't believe her ears. Me? What did I try to do? Regina, that night, Porter says you argued and went to sleep separately in the living room. After that, he doesn't remember anything. You stabbed him several times, Regina, and then just lay down on the floor next to his bed. The knife was in your hand. Nicole, that can't be true. What are you talking about? Yes, Regina, that's what the police said. Leo found you like that. Fortunately, he came back early to pick up Gabby's vitamins. She'd forgotten them at home, and she needs to take them every day. He called the police and an ambulance. Now Leo and Gabby are at home, and Porter is in the hospital. And you're in the hospital too. And which hospital am I in? Regina closed her eyes, feeling like she was about to lose consciousness. You don't know, Regina. Nicole looked surprised. You're in a psychiatric hospital. They say you had some kind of nervous breakdown. You lost control and... Nicole couldn't finish. Regina fainted. When Regina came to, Nicole was gone. There were tears and screams. 
Regina heard her own scream, wild and primal, but it felt like it was coming from somewhere else, as if she were somewhere beyond this world. Only her body continued to writhe and scream, scream and scream. Nicole never returned, and Regina sank into her phantom existence. Days passed in a blur. Some people came, but Regina didn't recognize any of them. She had a strong feeling that someone had tried to kill her, and it was Gabby, though she couldn't understand why. Regina couldn't have stabbed Porter. She loved her husband more than life itself. Why wasn't Leo coming? And, worst of all, why was Gabby coming? Regina saw her in her room. Gabby spoke softly, smiled, and showed Regina a syringe filled with some liquid. Regina was terrified of injections but couldn't fend her off. Her body wouldn't obey. Gabby. Gabby would kill her, just like she tried to kill Porter. And what was even scarier, this country bumpkin might even kill Leo. Regina seemed powerless to stop it. Why was Gabby here at all? What was happening? How was she allowed in? Why was she yes alone? Regina felt she was going to die soon, never seeing her son one last time. This thought terrified her more than anything. How long had this existence lasted? Regina didn't know. She was just there, like a plant or a stone. But inside that stone, a storm of fear and anguish raged. The inability to express it, to tell anyone, was killing Regina. One day she woke up and saw Gabby sitting by her bed, reading something. Regina groaned. Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Gabby jumped up and approached Regina. Does something hurt? What? What are you doing here? Gabby frowned. I'm working. Don't you remember? I come here often. The doctor ordered to reduce your medication. I'm keeping an eye on you for now. How are you feeling? Go away, Gabby, please, go away. And tell me where my son is. Regina rasped. I'm not Gabby. The girl put her hand on Regina's forehead. You don't seem to have a fever. Gabby, don't lie to me. Listen, my name is Leanne, the girl said with a slight smile, you must be confusing me with someone else. Regina's mouth fell open. This couldn't be. What Leanne? It was Gabby. Her eyes, her hair, and eyebrows. Although the hair seemed a bit lighter, but it could be dyed. Why are you lying to me? Leanne shook her head. I'm not lying. My name is really Leanne. I'm a nurse. Regina tried to sit up, but something was holding her down, preventing her from getting up. Oh, you see, it's to keep you from getting rowdy. Take this off me quickly, Regina demanded. Sorry, I can't, Leanne said, crouching down and looking Regina in the eyes. You understand, don't you? Please, Regina said quietly. No, it wasn't Gabby. But she looked so much like her. Gabby's eyes were almost black, while Leanne's were a tea color. But the resemblance was striking. Or was Regina just imagining it? Well, okay, I'll untie you, Leanne whispered, but please, don't tell anyone. A minute later, Regina sat up, stretching her wrists. Leanne sat back down, watching Regina warily, as if she might attack her at any moment. Why do you keep calling me Gabby? the nurse asked. Do I look like someone? Regina nodded in response. Yes, like two drops of water. Strange, Leanne murmured. You're recovering quickly from the medication. What do you mean, Leanne? You're behaving normally, Leanne smiled. Usually, patients act a bit differently. They told me I tried to kill my husband. Is that true? They say it's true, Leanne admitted. But I'm not an investigator. I don't know anything. But I didn't do that. Regina looked at the nurse pleadingly, shuddering. The resemblance was striking. It couldn't be a coincidence. Or had Regina really lost her mind, stabbed her husband, and ended up in a psychiatric hospital? What a way to end a life. You don't remember anything at all, 
do you? By the way, they're giving you very strong drugs. It's not surprising, Leanne said thoughtfully, looking at Regina. Your daughter-in-law said you behaved strangely before. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Have you seen her? Gabby? Regina exclaimed. Quiet, quiet, Leanne said, pressing a finger to her lips. Don't shout, please. No, I haven't seen her. I've read your file. The doctor mentioned it. But I didn't kill anyone, Regina moaned. There's such a fog in my head. I really don't remember anything. It's the medication, Leanne nodded. They have that effect, even on a healthy person. Do you come here alone? Regina asked. Well, yes, it's just me and another girl, Leanne replied. Does it matter? Yes, it matters a lot. Please don't give me that stuff. But I can't, it's an order, I could get in trouble, Leanne said, looking frightened. Please, help me, Regina pleaded. I won't hurt anyone, I won't lash out, just give me a chance. Leanne fidgeted with her robe. Regina, listen, I can't promise you anything. I'll die if this continues, Regina said. I know it for sure. I need to see my son and talk to him. Do I look insane to you? Leanne bit her lip. I'll try. I'll do everything I can to help you. Regina didn't know whether to believe Leanne's words or not. But she had no choice. Leanne hadn't lied to her. Every evening, she came to the room and emptied the syringe's contents onto the floor, then unfastened Regina's restraints. Regina still didn't understand what was happening. The resemblance between Leanne and Gabby frightened her. Her mind was shrouded in a sticky, unpleasant fog. Memories refused to return, but gradually her thoughts began to clear. Regina didn't remember what had happened that night, but she was certain she hadn't tried to kill Porter. If that was the case, then this person might try again. Or, even worse, do something to Leo. You need to understand, I can't release you. It's not within my power. I spoke with the doctor, and he thinks you're experiencing acute psychosis. But can you see it? This psychosis? Regina asked. Am I really that out of control? Am I attacking you or spouting nonsense, Leanne? Something terrible and confusing has happened. Someone tried to kill my husband and frame me. This conversation repeated over and over, but Regina's words had no effect on Leanne. The patient fell into despair, even considering harming herself. What was the point of living? She was of no use to her son, and her husband would never trust her again. And Gabby? What did that snake have in mind? And why did Gabby look so much like Leanne? The resemblance was only superficial. Leanne slouched slightly, while Gabby always sat up straight. When Leanne was nervous, she fidgeted with her clothes, something Gabby never did. Also, Leanne had dimples on her cheeks when she smiled, while Gabby didn't. Regina couldn't make sense of what was happening. But Leanne was the only person who talked to her and seemed to believe her. One evening, Leanne came to the room looking distressed. Regina, I saw your daughter-in-law. We really do look alike, Leanne said. And I found out something else. They're transferring you to another place. What? Regina asked, alarmed. Where are they transferring me? To a different hospital, Leanne said. With a different regime. I'm afraid they might kill you there. What? Oh my God. Regina felt her mouth go dry. Oh God, what should I do? Regina, I don't know, Leanne shook her head. You see, I trust you. I believe you haven't done anything, but I can't help you. You can. You can help. Please, do something. Regina pleaded. No, I really can't, Leanne stood up and looked at Regina with a strange calmness. Then she winked. I have to go. Please, don't leave, Leanne, don't go. I won't restrain you, Leanne smiled. Rest. 
she took off her coat and threw it over a chair, then gave Regina a nod as if saying goodbye. Oh, by the way, today is a special day, Regina. We celebrated the head nurse's birthday, and now all the girls are taking a nap. I'll go catch some rest, too. Leanne left. The coat remained draped over the chair. Regina got up, picked up the coat, and heard something jingle in the pocket. Keys. Regina quickly pulled the coat over her hospital pajamas. She couldn't wait. She peeked cautiously into the hallway. No one was in sight. There was no time to think. She hurriedly set out to find the exit. The exit from the hell she found herself in. Regina didn't think, she just walked confidently, not looking around. There were surely cameras around. Hopefully, Leanne had considered that. The exit from the ward was easy to find. Regina made her way down to the first floor. A security guard was dozing at his post. She managed to slip past him without trouble. Finally, she was outside. It was cool and windy. Regina quickly felt the cold, but freezing was a relief. After so long in a stuffy room that felt more like a prison cell. This cell might threaten Regina again if she didn't figure out what had really happened. She fumbled through the coat pocket and found a piece of paper. Unfolding it, she saw an address. Go there, Leanne had written. The cold air cleared Regina's thoughts. She knew where she needed to go. But what if it was a trap? Still, there were no other options. Either go back to the psychiatric hospital and wait to be sent off to some unknown place, spending the rest of her life among the insane, or move forward. Not for herself, but for her son. Regina took off the coat. She almost threw it away but changed her mind. It was evidence. She stuffed the coat under her pajamas and hurried down the street, trying to avoid well-lit areas. Luckily, the psychiatric hospital was in one of the quietest neighborhoods. Few cars passed by, and there were no pedestrians. She hoped nothing had happened to Leanne. Poor girl, how risky it was for her. And all for what? To save a stranger like Regina. But that was a concern for later. For now, she needed to go where Leanne had directed her. Soon she found the house, a five-story building. Regina gripped the keys tightly. When there are no choices, decisions make themselves. She climbed to the third floor, inserted the key into the lock, and gently, trying not to make any noise, turned the key. The door opened. Regina stepped into the apartment. It was empty. The only thing that greeted her was a huge cat, which startled her. The uninvited guest tiptoed into the room. A couch, a wardrobe, a table. Cheap furnishings. But she didn't have the strength to inspect. She collapsed onto the couch and fell asleep instantly, either from anxiety or exhaustion. This sleep was deep and pleasant. She was awakened by voices, a man and a woman. What are you doing, Leanne? Dylan, I told you, she was on medication. Her daughter-in-law lied, saying Regina attacked them with a knife. And you brought her here. They'll come looking for her. I'll take her to my mom's today, to the village, and no one will find her there. We'll figure things out from there. We need to help this woman, she clearly isn't guilty. You're going to be in court, along with her. I won't. I'll say I forgot the coat and the patient took advantage of the situation. Regina sat up. Her head didn't hurt, and her mind was frighteningly clear. She realized she was in a situation that seemed to have no way out. It was easier to live under those medications. Good morning, Leanne peeked into the room. Regina flinched at how much she resembled Gabby. It couldn't be a coincidence, it just couldn't. Leanne entered and sat in a chair. How did you sleep? Have you thought about what to do next? There is one option. Yes, a great option. Behind Leanne came a man in his late twenties or early thirties, with sharp features, an intriguing pale complexion, and green eyes. 
He wore black plastic framed glasses. Dylan, please don't start, Leanne said, grimacing. This is my husband, Dylan. Nice to meet you, I'm Regina, the woman nodded. I'm sorry for any trouble I've caused, Dylan. Trouble? Not at all, Dylan waved his hands. No questions for you, but my wife. Dylan. Leanne snapped at him. What was I supposed to do? Dylan approached his wife and stroked her head. Regina, are you really in your right mind? Dylan. Leanne glared at him, as if trying to burn him with her gaze. Yes, I'm in my right mind, Regina nodded. I hope so. I have doubts, of course, but who doesn't? Well, I told you, Leanne said with a smile. Dylan, it's time for you and Regina to go. Me too, the guest asked. Yes, yes, you'll go to my mom's place for now, and I'll get in touch with your relatives and try to talk to them, Leanne replied. I don't see any other options at the moment. Gabby insists that you killed your husband, or at least tried to. She's lying, Regina said. I never attacked anyone with a knife, and I never even thought of doing such a thing. You see, I believe you. But it's better for you to stay there for now, and it's important to move you discreetly, Leanne frowned. But how? In the trunk, Dylan suggested. Darling, what are you saying? Leanne exclaimed. Regina, we're the same size, and you've lost a lot of weight in the hospital. Please put on my clothes and dark glasses. Before leaving, Regina took a shower. The reflection in the mirror horrified her. She was almost unrecognizable now. Sunken cheeks, pale skin, dark circles under her eyes, and protruding collarbones. She didn't need any disguise. How much weight had she lost? Well, it seemed her wish had come true. Regina had wanted to lose weight, and the universe had answered. She changed into blue jeans, a plaid shirt, a cap, and dark glasses. In the mirror, a thin, unfamiliar woman with sharp cheekbones and thin lips stared back at her. Together with Dylan, she got into the car. Where are we going? Regina asked. I see you've given in to fate, Dylan smirked. We're going to Leanne's mother's village. Hopefully, they won't look for you there, at least not right away. Believe me, the head doctor has no reason to publicize your disappearance. It'll be a while before the police get involved. They'll search on their own for now. And how long do you think we have? Well, Leanne says we've got about a week. We? Yeah, Dylan shrugged. Leanne's like that. Always getting involved. She's told me all about you, how you're innocent and they've locked you up in a mental ward. She's kind-hearted, always bringing someone home. Once, she dragged a homeless man in, and we helped him get his documents back. And cats and dogs, don't even get me started. And now it's me, Regina sighed. The man nodded. Yeah. You know, I believe her. Leanne has a good intuition. That homeless guy. Turned out he was a professor. His kids tried to take his apartment, so they got him on the street. If Leanne says you're innocent and need help, I've got no choice but to follow her lead. Intuition. Really? Regina asked. You believe in that? Regina, why wouldn't I? Dylan nodded. It runs in her family. Her mother was a gypsy. Wow. A gypsy? That's something. Regina whistled. Yep. But her mother abandoned her. Apparently, her mom was the daughter of a Romani leader or something. She left Leanne to go back to the camp. I don't know all the details, and neither does Leanne. She was raised by her adoptive mom, Michelle. That's who we're heading to now. You haven't even asked where exactly we're going. I just don't have any other choice, Regina explained. Smart, Dylan agreed. Regina dozed off and slept through most of the trip. Dylan woke her up once for lunch, but she fell asleep again right after. The stress had taken its toll. She fully woke up only when they arrived. 
The car was parked in front of a small house with charming carved shutters. Well, shall we? Dylan smiled. Michelle's waiting. Leanne's mother turned out to be a pleasant-looking woman, slightly older than Regina herself. She was full-figured, dressed in a tracksuit, with long black hair pulled back into a high ponytail. It was clear that Michelle took care of herself. Hello. Michelle glanced at Regina. You're so skinny. What did they do to you? They treated me, Regina shrugged. With what, I don't even know. Oh dear, Michelle sighed. Well, let's have dinner and chat. Dylan, you go ahead and leave. Dylan said goodbye to his mother-in-law and drove off to see his wife. Regina suddenly felt like a character in a bad movie. Everything seemed off. It was as if her life had been strung together on a thread, and now someone had pulled that thread out, scattering the beads all over the floor. How was she supposed to put them back together? She had no idea. Michelle welcomed her with surprising calm, invited her to the table, placed a plate of homemade food in front of Regina, and sat across from her with a cup of tea. Regina started eating, but couldn't manage much before feeling nauseous. It seemed she had completely lost the habit of eating normal food during her time in the mental institution. Leanne told me what happened, Michelle said. What do you have to say? Regina hesitated. There's nothing to say. I don't know what happened, but I couldn't have hurt my husband. Sure, we argued, but rarely. I love him, I really do. Yeah, I get it, Michelle sighed. Well, if Leanne says you're telling the truth. Dylan already mentioned her intuition, Regina noted. It's not really intuition, Michelle smirked. It's something else. I took her in when she was five. Before that, she was in an orphanage. I wanted a child, so I went to the orphanage. I was planning to adopt a baby. But then Leanne comes up to me and says, you're going to be my mom. And she just looked at me with those eyes. What else could I do? I signed the papers, took her home, and became her mom, just like she said. She was special right from the start. In what way? Regina asked. Well, she could find lost things. She always knew when someone was lying, she just felt it. Couldn't explain how. And one time, she saved my life. I was supposed to go into town for a friend's birthday, take the bus. Leanne clung to my leg, crying, screaming, you're not going. There was only one bus running back then, and I missed it because of her. I came home, ready to scold her. But then I found out that the bus had crashed. Three people died, and six were in the hospital. If it weren't for Leanne, I might not be here. I've always trusted her, and I still do. So, if she says we need to hide you, then we do. If she believes you, I believe you. Period. My God, that's incredible. Regina muttered. With abilities like that, she should be working in the police force, not a psychiatric hospital. Maybe she gets it from her parents. Michelle shrugged. I don't know much about them, only that her mother was a gypsy. They're known for fortune-telling and seeing the future. So, Leanne probably inherited it. Regina shivered as a sudden thought hit her. Listen, Michelle, does Leanne have any brothers or sisters? I don't know, Michelle said. She was alone in the orphanage, for sure. Nobody wanted to take her. But she turned out great. Graduated from medical school with honors, by the way. Why do you ask? Well, she looks a lot like my sister-in-law, Regina explained. And she also grew up without a mother. They said she died when Gabby was very young. And the resemblance is striking. At first, I thought it was her, Gabby. They're like twins. Regina, strange things happen, Michelle said thoughtfully, staring into Regina's eyes. You're saying they look that much alike. Like two drops of water, I swear. There are a few small differences, but... Listen, Regina, I have a crazy idea. What if... 
who do you think could have tried to kill your husband? I don't know, Regina replied. Thinking about Porter was painful. Regina hadn't even seen him and had no idea how he was doing. And Leo, her son hadn't visited her once. He must believe that his mother tried to kill his father. Could your Gabby have done it? Michelle asked suddenly. Regina flinched. Why would she? She only benefited from her marriage to my son. She came from a poor background and ended up in a good family. But she couldn't have done it just because I didn't like her. Porter respected her, loved her. Michelle's eyes lit up. Listen, my Leanne never does anything without a reason, you have to trust me. She fought to get into that hospital, got a job there a couple of months ago, and you're the first person she met. And that resemblance, Regina, we need to find out more about your Gabby. Michelle, I don't understand. Why would Gabby do something like this? Could she really have done it? We'll find out everything, don't worry. Does Gabby have any family? Yes, Regina nodded. Her father, I think, and her stepmother, or rather, her aunt, her father's sister. Regina paused, thinking. Do you think they know something? We've got time, so we need to take action. Let's dig up some information about this girl. What time is it? Oh, it's late, we won't make it today. Tomorrow, we'll head to the orphanage where I found Leanne. There's a good woman working there. Leanne gave her injections last year, so she might agree to look through the archives. Michelle's eyes gleamed with even more intensity, and Regina nodded. It was strange. Sitting beside Michelle made Regina feel calm, despite everything she had been through. Or maybe it was her mind protecting itself from overload. If someone had told her a year ago that something like this would happen, she would have gone mad. But now. The worst had already happened. By all logic, she should be crying into a pillow. But instead, she sat there, drinking tea and talking. The human mind is a remarkable thing, both amazing and unpredictable. All right, darling, I can see you're sleepy, Michelle observed. I made up the couch for you, go get some rest. Tomorrow we'll head out. In the meantime, I'll call that woman and make arrangements. Thank you, Regina said sincerely. You're welcome. We should help people, especially since my life's so boring. At least this is some entertainment. Michelle laughed. Just hope we don't all end up in jail. Michelle's calmness rubbed off on Regina. She was sure now that she hadn't tried to harm her husband. Regina would prove it, no matter what it took. For now, it was too painful for Regina to even think about her husband, he had barely survived. God, let him be all right, let her see him again, hold him, and apologize for everything. He had been the perfect husband, caring, kind, she was absolutely sure of that. Regina fell asleep thinking of Porter, convinced they would meet soon and everything would go back to the way it was. To hell with Gabby. If she was innocent, Regina would accept her and never say a bad word to her again. The next morning, Regina was woken up by an excited Michelle. Get up. I called the woman I told you about, her name's Faith. She says we should come over today. Regina quickly got ready, putting on jeans and a shirt that Leanne had lent her, silently promising herself to repay the girl somehow. Though honestly, she knew she could never fully repay her for helping her escape, for giving her a chance to find out the truth, even at the risk of her own career. That, too, Regina would think about when all of this was over. Michelle had a car and drove quite recklessly. A couple of times, Regina's heart nearly jumped out of her chest. But after an hour and a half, they finally arrived at the orphanage. It was a two-story white building surrounded by a fence. The yard had a playground, though it was empty when Regina and Michelle got there. It's so sad, Michelle sighed as she got out of the car. I can't imagine how someone could just abandon their own child. Yeah, I can't either, Regina admitted. My son's grown up now, but I still see him as that little three-year-old. Innocent and clueless. 
That's how it always is, Michelle nodded. Come on, Faith is waiting for us. Faith looked to be around fifty, with a kind, freckled face and a warm smile. There was something about her that made you trust her instantly. Regina thought this woman seemed perfectly suited for her job, it was clear she loved kids, and they probably felt the same about her. Faith hugged Michelle and nodded at Regina. Hi, Michelle. How's everything? How's Leanne? All good, Michelle kissed Faith on the cheek. We're here on an interesting matter. Tell me, do you know if Leanne had any sisters? I pulled up her file from the archive yesterday. Let's go to my office. Faith's office was on the second floor. As Regina walked, she could hear children's voices echoing in the distance, and her heart clenched. Poor kids, abandoned and unwanted. Maybe, after all this was over, she could adopt one. Why not? She had the strength, the money. But it was too early to think about that now. Faith's office was cramped, with just enough room for a desk and two chairs. Regina had to stand. Faith handed a folder to Michelle. Now, don't tell anyone about this. I'm breaking a few rules here just for you, Michelle, Faith smiled. But what's going on? I'll fill you in later, Michelle said, opening the folder. Okay, let's see. Hmm, I know all this. Wait, two children. Faith put on her glasses and looked at the documents. Yes, yes, Michelle, too. She had a sister. The mother took the sister, but left Leanne behind. I talked to the caretaker who worked here back then, and it's true, Leanne's mother was a Romani woman. They asked her why she wasn't taking both children, and she said she couldn't handle it. The girls were three years old at the time. Michelle and Regina exchanged a glance. What else does the caretaker remember? Regina asked. Well, she remembers some things. The girls looked very much alike, apparently. They were inseparable. Leanne cried a lot when they took the sister away. By the way, the sister's name was Gabby. Leanne couldn't calm down for a whole month. Is there an address for Gabby's mother? Regina asked. Yes, it's in the file, but she may have moved. It's been quite some time, Faith nodded. Michelle flipped through the pages. Here it is, Frosttown. Something clicked in Regina's mind. Frosttown, that's where Lisa and Nigel, who raised Gabby, live. But where did her mother go? Regina? Regina, are you okay? You're shaking, do you need some water? Michelle's voice broke through Regina's thoughts. No, no, I'm fine, Regina replied, though her voice sounded distant, like it wasn't even her own. I think I'm starting to understand something. Gabby's 21, the same age as Leanne. 22 years ago, Porter went on a folklore expedition. Regina was furious with him at the time. She had just given birth to Leo and was struggling on her own. But Porter insisted that the trip was necessary. He was collecting material for his PhD dissertation and wanted to finish it as soon as possible. He was gone for four months. Daughter. He had called Gabby his daughter. He must have sensed something, after all. They even looked alike. Regina, snap out of it, Michelle shook her by the shoulders. What are you mumbling about? No, no, I'm fine. It's just stuffy in here, Regina replied. They returned to Michelle's place, but Regina was still shaking, her thoughts racing. Gabby and Leanne, they had their father's eyes. Porter's eyes. That night, Regina couldn't sleep. The next morning, she went to see Lisa and Nigel. When Lisa saw her, she nearly fainted. Regina? You should be in the hospital, oh my god. Lisa? Tell me, how did you end up with Gabby? Where did she come from? Lisa looked away. Regina, I need to call the police. They're probably looking for you. Regina gently placed her hand on Lisa's shoulder. Please, just tell me. Then you can call the police. 
Lisa hesitated for a moment, then nodded. All right, come in. I always told Gabby she was wrong, that she shouldn't be doing this. Who knew it would go this far? Savannah, the mother of Gabby and Leanne, was Nigel's sister, the daughter of a Romani baron, and the most beautiful woman around. She was the best dancer, the most sought-after bride. Her father wasn't in any rush to marry her off, wanting her to choose a husband from her heart. Who would dare argue with a baron? So, Savannah lived like a princess, getting everything she wanted. Her father adored her more than anyone else in the world. One day, their camp stopped near a small village, the same one where Porter's folklore expedition had arrived. The young scholars decided to visit the camp, hoping to find legends or record Romani songs. Plus, they were simply curious, they had never interacted with a nomadic people before. That's when Porter saw Savannah for the first time and was stunned by her beauty. Big black eyes, hair so long it almost reached her knees, and sun-kissed skin. She didn't seem like she was from this world. She reminded him of an exotic bird, bright, unusual, passionate. He felt like he was in love. He gave Savannah a gold ring with a ruby that he had bought for his unsuspecting wife. And Savannah accepted the gift. They began meeting in secret. How that love was born, only God knows. A young scholar and a Romani princess, it seemed they were drawn to each other precisely because they were so different. Porter even considered leaving his wife and son to marry Savannah. Why not? The boy wasn't even his biological child. His wife was simple and straightforward, but Savannah. Savannah was mysterious, otherworldly, and all the more captivating because of it. But by the end of the expedition, Porter came to his senses, with the help of his friends. Don't lose your mind, they told him. You've had your fun, now that's enough. But how would you live with her? What would you do with her? She's used to a different life. Go back to your wife and son and forget about this girl. Porter did just that. He met with Savannah one last time, promised he would return for her, help her escape the camp, and then left for home. He bought Regina a different ring, this time with a small emerald, as a way to apologize for his long absence and his infidelity. Of course, he would never tell her about the affair. The ring was just to ease his guilty conscience. After he left, Savannah realized she was pregnant. It caused a huge scandal. Her father had forgiven her many things, but not this. Not a betrayal of their traditions. And so, Savannah left. And her brother Nigel followed her. He felt sorry for his sister, knowing she wouldn't make it on her own. What happened next and how Nigel and Savannah lived, Lisa didn't know. Nigel didn't like to talk about it. He only shared that Savannah ran away from the hospital right after the twins were born. Nigel couldn't take the children, he had no job, no home. But he promised himself that he would do everything to find his sister and become the guardian of his nieces. But he didn't make it in time. Out of nowhere, Savannah appeared and took Gabby. And then someone else took Leanne. Nigel thought he had lost the children forever. He bought a house, found a job, and started living a normal life. Then, one day, Savannah showed up on his doorstep with little Gabby. She asked him to look after the child while she figured things out. She swore to Nigel that she would come back for her. And he believed her. Savannah didn't come back for a long ten years. In that time, Nigel moved in with Lisa. Lisa had been his neighbor, a simple woman who had never been able to build a family. She loved Gabby as if she were her own daughter. Nigel and Lisa weren't married, they were more like good friends. Nigel shared his life story only with Lisa. Then, Savannah reappeared. By that time, Gabby was already 15. Savannah would visit occasionally, but she never spoke about herself. She was poorly dressed, and her thinness scared Lisa. But Savannah wanted to stay connected with her daughter, and neither Lisa nor Nigel dared to object. After all, she was still Gabby's mother and had the right to see her. 
That's when Savannah began planting dangerous ideas in Gabby's head. Your father ruined my life, used me, then threw me away while he enjoys his life. He lives in a nice apartment while you're stuck in this rundown village shack. Your father has money, and his beloved son has everything he could ever want. And what about you? He doesn't care about you at all. He doesn't even know you exist. Those words had the desired effect. Gabby became consumed with the idea of revenge. Savannah knew that Leo wasn't Porter's biological son. Porter had told her this when he was planning to leave his wife. So, there was nothing standing in Gabby's way. Oh my God. Regina whispered. Lisa looked at her sadly. I tried talking to her, but she didn't care. Savannah had filled her head with the need for revenge. Regina clenched her hands so tightly that her nails dug into her palms. And then she married my son. Lisa nodded. Yes. I don't know how she did it, but she completely captivated him, like she'd cast a spell on him. At first, I thought she was genuinely in love with Leo. She couldn't stop talking about him, walking around all happy. I thought everything would work out between them. Leo is a good boy, such a good boy. And Gabby seemed to be glowing. Then she got pregnant, and I finally stopped worrying. I thought those foolish ideas had left her head for good. But then Savannah came back, and they spent the whole day talking. Gabby cried afterward. And after that, I don't know what happened. I only know that your husband ended up in the ICU, and you in a mental hospital. Why didn't you stop her? Regina whispered. Lisa, why didn't you stop Gabby? I didn't know, Lisa rubbed her forehead nervously. I honestly thought she loved Leo for real. I didn't think she'd do anything bad. And I don't know how she did it. I only know that after that conversation with Savannah, Gabby wasn't herself. And after that. And you stayed silent. Regina yelled. You stayed silent. You knew she could destroy us, that she would try to do it. Don't blame her. Lisa looked directly into Regina's eyes, and the intensity of her gaze sent chills down Regina's spine. It's Savannah. It's all Savannah. Okay, but where is Gabby? Where's my son? Regina grabbed Lisa's hand. Lisa, where are they? They left, said they were going on vacation. Tell me where. They're at my friend's place. I'll give you the address. Regina, please don't ruin her life. She's just a young, confused girl. She's lost. Regina sighed. Lisa, I don't know what to do. All I know is that I need to save my son. I understand, Regina, but please, let her keep her freedom. The next few days blurred into one endless day for Regina. She went to see her son. When Gabby saw Regina, she broke down. She cried, begged for forgiveness, tried to hug her, pleaded that she didn't know anything. Then she admitted that she had been adding some kind of medicine, given to her by her mother, Savannah, to Regina's tea and food. Who? Who tried to kill my husband? Regina asked in a cold voice. Gabby, was it you? No, Gabby sobbed. My mom found someone. I knew they were coming, but I didn't want it. I didn't. I asked Leo to go find you and bring you those vitamins. Leo looked at his wife, confused and trembling with fear. Gabby, but how? We were together. No, Leo, you're not related, Regina said. I, we never told you, son. Porter isn't your biological father. What? Leo went pale. How? Why? What did I do to deserve this? Regina's heart broke with pain, but no more tears came. She had to endure this and not fall apart. Gabby, where is your mother? Regina shook the girl by her shoulders. You have to tell me. Right now. They found Savannah. She had been hiding with her new man, who had helped her carry out the revenge. Gabby, however, disappeared, 
vanished as if she had fallen off the face of the earth. Regina didn't want to look for her, only hoping that Gabby would find peace. It seemed like Lisa and Nigel knew where Gabby had gone but refused to say. Still, Regina couldn't help but feel some sympathy for Gabby. She had found what seemed like a family, only to lose it all because of her mother's foolishness, her need for revenge. Gabby had become nothing more than a pawn, paying a heavy price for it. The charges against Regina were dropped. A month later, Porter was released from the hospital. At first, it was difficult for Regina to talk to him. They lived like strangers for a while. But eventually, they had the conversation, about the old affair and about the children Savannah had given birth to. Leanne finally met her real father. Regina even thought she had gained a daughter, one to replace the one she lost so many years ago, the one who never got to be born because of her. Leo's son slowly started to recover. He began smiling again, getting back into sports, and even became friends with Leanne, whom he seemed to start seeing as a sister. Then one day, Regina received a call from Faith, the same friend of Michelle's from the orphanage, asking her to come visit. At the orphanage, Faith showed Regina a little girl who looked exactly like Leo, as if they were twins. You understand, don't you? Faith said quietly. Michelle said you would. Regina took her granddaughter in her arms and smiled. Yes, I understand. And I will correct the mistakes of the past, even if they weren't mine to begin with. What will you name her? She doesn't even have a name. She was left with nothing but a blanket, Faith said, gently stroking the child's head. Gabby. We'll name her Gabby, after her mother, Regina replied. Maybe things with her husband, Porter, would never be the same. Maybe her son, Leo, would never forget what had happened. But Regina knew one thing for certain, this little girl would be happy.